Last week, I published a short documentary with National Geographic titled Fred the Tap Dancing Turkey. If you haven't checked it out, please do either here on my channel or over on National Geographic because this week's video, we're gonna be breaking down this short. We're gonna go over my gear list, the production and cinematography side of things, the writing and the editing, and then also I'm gonna talk about how I thought about my distribution strategy. So let's get into it. Hey everyone, if you're new here, my name is Austin Meyer. I'm a documentary filmmaker, National Geographic Explorer. And on this channel, I share the field tested skills, mindsets, and lessons that have helped me on my journey as a documentary filmmaker. First thing I wanna say about this story is that this whole production was very simple. The filming took place at an animal sanctuary about an hour from where I live. I had no budget. I filmed it alone over the course of three days. And then I edited it, edited it, it over the course of one week. And yeah, it's something I'm, I'm super proud of because it seems to have impacted at least a few people to view turkeys or farmed animals in general as the individuals they are rather than as the commodities our society so often treats them as. And that is an issue I'm really passionate about. So as we get into this and break things down, just something to keep in mind that there's so much value and meaning and joy and development as a filmmaker that can be gained from simple projects without the overhead of extensive travel or budget or crew. So yeah, all right. Let's uh, first hit on the gear list for the camera. I shot majority of the clips in the film on the Sony FX6. I shot some of the gimbal shots on the Sony A7S III. And then for the drone shots in there, I used a DJI Mavic 2 Pro. Lenses, I used the Sony 24 to 70 2.8. That was my main lens that I used for most of the shots. And then I also used a Sigma Art 24 Prime. Uh, I used that for the interviews and then on a couple shots, I used a Sony 70 to 200 2.8, mostly when I wanted to capture behavior of the turkey outside of the turkey space. So I wanted just more space away from Fred to see if Fred would demonstrate just a different type of behavior rather than when I was so up close and personal to him. For the audio, I used onboard shotgun mic. That is the Sennheiser MKH8060. And then I used uh, wireless lav mics during the interviews and also the little scenes. And those were the Sony wireless UTX URX lav mic system with a cause 11 D uh, microphone. Okay, so lighting, I used no lighting on this project whatsoever. Support, what I put my camera on during this, I used the Sactler tripod that I recently talked about in, in a couple weeks ago on the channel. And then I also used like a super old gimbal. I think it's the uh, Zhiyun Crane 2, which I think came out in like 2017, I used that. That's the only gimbal I have. Now let's uh, get into the production. I filmed this in three days. In each of the three days, I had a specific goal. And so I think to walk you through the making of this project, I think it would be most helpful to kind of talk you through how I viewed the goal and production of each of those three days. So heading into day one of the production, something to note is that I've spent a lot of time at this sanctuary for another project that I am working on. So even before getting there to film Fred, I knew the people there. I'd spent a lot of time around Fred and that meant I could do a lot of really quality pre-production work to be as efficient as possible when filming. And so that pre-production work mostly looked like writing a first draft of the intro narration which is in rhyming couplets. So I wanted it to have this fairy tale like quality. I wanted to mirror the tone and playfulness of Fred's character. And writing this before my first day of shooting not only guided specific shots that I'd get, but also guided a tone for like which I could view the world. It was like, <laughs> the tone of that narration that I wrote was almost like a lens through which I could see everything around me and just choose where to focus my camera. And it also guided some of the questions that I asked during the interview uh, on day one. So let's take a look at this intro sequence. So here is the narration that I wrote heading into day one, just like hit the ground running with some shots that I know are gonna be in the piece. 
And so we can take a look at this intro sequence, see how that panned out. I used a couple quotes up here just to get intrigued to get going. Fred, oh my goodness. He just deserves such a flowery introduction. In Northern California lies a place so divine where rolling hills meet redwoods and the sun doth shine. Where animals who are rescued now roam free. Rancho Compasión is the name of this sanctuary. So this sequence is all about getting a sense of the setting, meeting some of the film's participants, and then also creating expectations for the audience about the tone of the piece. Uh, that it's gonna feel like a fairy tale, it will be a bit playful. I enjoy this combination of shots here, these kind of dark shadows and really close up details uh, because then it makes it so like, by the time that we see Fred right here, it's like this grand reveal, like the curtain is opening. And that's kind of how it feels when you actually meet Fred in person. So the rest of day one was spent getting a lot of close-ups, beauty shots of Fred, and also for me to get a deeper sense of his personality. And then before leaving, I did an interview with Cammie, who is the director of the sanctuary and had so much knowledge about it animal behavior. And the reason I wanted to do an interview with her on day one is that because based on her description of Fred's behavior, I could focus day two of production on capturing those details, many of which uh, slipped by me on day one because I didn't know like the intricacies of Fred's behavior to look for. From a cinematography perspective, I chose to frame all my interviews very similarly on the 24 millimeter prime. And I asked everyone to look into the lens because I wanted it to feel like a personal connection between the viewers and the people speaking in the film, almost like it feels like they're guests on a guided tour of the sanctuary. And I didn't have any lighting equipment, didn't have like a boom pole set up, just had like a lav mic under, under their shirt. And the audio is not perfect, the lighting's not perfect, but you know, I, the people I was filming, they were on the clock, they were working. I wasn't trying to take a bunch of their time. So we just kept the, sim the setup super simple. For day two of production, my focus was to capture scenes of Fred interacting with people and showing off his impressive courting display that Cammie talked about during day one's interview. So I worked with the sanctuary to find a day when a school was gonna be visiting. We contacted that school, requested permission to film, got it, and then I went out there. So this scene right here after the intro sequence is from that day and I'm really happy with, with how it turned out because it's so fun to see Fred interact with guests and just be in that moment with no music and no narration. Uh, for me, it draws me deeper into the world and I love how you get a sense of Fred's behavior from the perspective of guests who are odd by him, but don't exactly know what he's doing or what it means. And it poses a question, what is Fred doing? Why does his head change color? Why does he tap dance? And these questions are kind of open loops that keep the audience engaged and wondering about the answer, keeps them sticking around. And it gives me an opportunity in the edit to give them payoffs throughout the piece by answering those questions. So the last thing I did on day two was film this interview here with Miyoko. And I really liked the look of this interview, even though that interview was the one that I had the most trouble with the with the 24 millimeter prime lens. Um, I had a lot of kind of like pulsing focus hunting from that lens, but her quotes were so good. I was like, doesn't matter. Like that's going in the story because the powerful quotes are what matters the most. But maybe, maybe you can see it here. If you look at the tree trunk, you'll see it. How deep their feelings are. How? You know, it's kind of going in and out of focus just slightly. But again, I just put like a warp stabilizer on it in, in post-production and had like a, uh, I keyframed it so it's slowly zooming in on her. So you don't really see it, but it's just something that as I'm trying to Improve, that's something I wanna improve at. I probably should have gone to you know, an F2 rather than a 1.4, maybe slowed down the autofocus transition speed. So just something to note there. And finally on day three, I did my final interview with Caroline and got some B-roll of 
just Fred doing his thing. And I don't know if you, any of you have ever filmed with animals, but it takes so much patience. And even in a controlled setting, like a sanctuary, you have to spend a lot of hours with the animals to capture a variety of behavior. So that's how I set up my three days of production. And a final note about the cinematography on this project is just how critical camera placement was in the service of communicating perspective and a point of view. So almost every single shot of Fred is either at his eye level or looking up at him. And for a piece that is attempting to get people to see turkeys as individuals and not food, it's so important that we don't look down at Fred. So I wanted the cinematography to flip that norm for us to be on the same level as him or even look up to him with this sort of reverence. It's a choice that not only brings us into his perspective and point of view being at his eye level, but also it mirrors the message of the film. All right, so when it came to the edit, I started by transcribing my three main interviews and then fitting the puzzle pieces of their quotes together onto an A-roll sequence. Next, I edited the main scene at the top of the piece and started to find these nice verite moments to use as transition points during the piece, like this little conversation that happens right before the end sequence of the story. When a horse and a cow to the apple, yeah, if you bring some apples, we could feed them to the cow. Yeah, love it. I love that idea. And a goat too. Absolutely. Yes, let's do that. Okay, have a good rest of your day, everybody. Yes, thank you. I like that moment because Caroline is is saying goodbye uh, to the guests and it's kind of signaling like this story is heading to an ending. Next, in the order of editing, I started to layer B-roll, do narration, find music, and drop in some sound effects. And I can definitely go into more detail about my process for each of those in a future video if you are interested in that. So just let me know in the comments. Over on my Instagram, I opened up a call for questions about the making of this story and Pam W423 asked, do you have an idea then shoot footage to illustrate it or shoot and see where it takes you? It's a great question and every story is different, but this one had a little bit of both. So like I said, for that intro sequence, I started by writing the poetic narration and then I shot to it. However, for the narrated sequence in the second half of the piece, that order was flipped. So for that one, I filmed all of that behavior like Smokey eating with Fred, uh, Fred chilling in the shade or cooling off by the fan. And then I wrote narration to those moments during post-production. Another thing I thought a lot about in the edit was what I refer to as the shape of the show. I, I wanted viewers to feel like there was something new around every corner from a narrated intro to a verite scene to an interview from faster paced cuts to slower ones. And then also four very distinct music cues. So the first is like this lilting piano that felt kind of like it's from the movie Up from Pixar. Then it goes to this plunky guitar song that feels kind of spot on for an animal sanctuary. Then it goes to a sexy R&B rhythm for Fred's courting section. And then the final music cue is this more sparse and contemplative guitar for those reflective quotes at the end of the story. So that's one of the big lessons on, on this edit and what I would urge you to think about when, when you're working on your next project is think about that shape of show. Make sure you're bringing your audience on an emotional journey uh, where it's not flat. You know, there's ups and downs. Think about that, that roller coaster ride of the story that your audience is on. And lastly, I wanna to touch on distribution. Uh, distribution is huge for us as filmmakers. Obviously, that's how we get these pieces seen. And I think what worked best on this piece and what I think is so important for us as independent filmmakers to think about is how does our story fit into the broader context of culture, of the moment that this piece is coming out into? And so for me, I knew with Thanksgiving coming up, I started working on this story in early October, I think was my first shoot. And even, even an early October shoot for a Thanksgiving story is kind of late in the game. But all that to say, I was thinking of, I want a piece that's gonna be ready to come out for Thanksgiving. And that's why when I had finished like a first draft of the story, 
I reached out to my connections, the New York Times video team. I reached out to Vox Media's team um, because I know Vox Media covers a lot of stories related to farmed animal issues. And then I reached out to National Geographic. Uh, National Geographic is a team, specifically their, their YouTube strategy team, is a team that I have personal connections to. I've published five previous short films where their short film showcase. So I have those connections and I knew it would be something they'd be interested in because you know, National Geographic's interested in stories about animals and kind of combine that with the timeliness uh, of Thanksgiving, it kind of made it so it was a nice fit there for them. They said, we'd love it for our short film showcase. And for the short film showcase, it's really just a distribution platform to give me a bigger audience than I might be able to reach on my own. I'm not paid anything from publishing on National Geographic Short Film Showcase. They essentially give independent filmmakers distribution. And for me, as this was a story that I, you know, it was all about impact for me on this story and the timing of this coming out. And so I didn't care about making any money on this one. I'm just like, I wanna reach the most amount of people. And so I was in a fortunate enough position that I could take that deal to offer non-exclusive rights to it. And that also meant that I was able to reach out to try to share this piece with other outlets even after National Geographic had taken it. So for me, I start to think about, okay, National Geographic's taken it. Where else might people be interested in this story? So I started thinking about what about all these animal rights groups out there that I know of who are looking for content at this holiday time period to put out there about animals. And so National Geographic doesn't have exclusivity. So now I can reach out to all of them and say, hey, this is coming out on National Geographic. I still have the rights to it. I'd love to work with you all to sh continue sharing this message. Maybe it could go on your blog. Maybe I can cut up some footage that wasn't used for social media to help it come out on your social media. And what ended up happening is I ended up partnering with an organization called We Animals Media um, that does a lot of investigative work and factory farms and things like that. And they paid me to make an Instagram reel where I took the main story for National Geographic and I just used the poem and put it into a real form. I also wrote to a vegan magazine called Forks Over Knives who reposted that reel. So this reel ended up getting seen by over 80,000. I think it's almost at 100,000 views in the last week. And so you can see there how I thought about kind of like National Geographic for the main distribution for the reputation that this piece can kind of like settle under. And then I also didn't stop there. I'm like, who else might be interested in this story? Keep thinking about that for your stories. Like who would want this? How do we get it in their hands? So just send the DM, send the email, get it in front of people who can help you get that story out to the audience you're looking for. You know, when I was sharing the story after it came out with people, one of the things I found myself writing a lot was, this is a piece that speaks to an issue I care about in a way that feels authentic to me and my personality. So it was so fun to create. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons for me around the making of this piece. I felt strong emotions heading into Thanksgiving because how over 46 million turkeys are treated. And I decided to channel that emotion into artistic action. I did it in a way that was true to my voice. Even the poem that is like at the core of the story. When I first came up with that idea to do a poem and use that as narration, there was this little part of me that's thinking like, ah, oh, that's not really professional. That's kind of might be a little bit cheesy. But I went ahead, I like trusted that intuition. I went for it. And of course, what is the thing I got the most positive feedback on out of everything in that story was the poem. So the lesson here is to notice where you have strong emotions and channel that into artistic action. You don't need to travel somewhere far off. You don't need a crew. You don't need funding. You just need to get started. Just start and then, and then finish. <laughs> All right, that's it for this breakdown. Thanks so much for being here. I hope that was helpful. Please let me know if it was. And if you enjoyed that one, you may also enjoy this video about how to find your next story idea. Until the next video, go out and tell some stories.